All right. So I am joined by a very special guest today, um, Suzanne Cook Greuter. Uh, Suzanne is a psycholog developmental psychologist researcher, and she uh, came up with uh, ego development theory, one of the theories that, is, that has fascinated me the most over the course of the last year, just really understanding the different stages of development and how the ego um, makes meaning out of the world and how the ways we make meaning out of the world changes as we go through the different developmental stages. And so uh, welcome, welcome to the podcast, Suzanne. Thanks for having me. I'm always curious to interact with a new person and new questions and new curiosities. Absolutely, absolutely. And I, I hope that's what we will accomplish today. Uh, we were speaking before the call around like you have you have a lot of interviews and content online around just the that what each stage of development means and uh that's that's pretty widespread on the internet these days and so i wanted to take a little bit of a different approach with this podcast and i wanted to um really dive into different ways in which you you're perceiving the world and interacting with the world given all the research that you've done throughout your life and then also just kind of using the models as like kind of a baseline understanding and then building on top of them and uh, to how we interact with the world and the crises we're facing today. Um, so yeah, how does that sound? Perfect. Awesome, awesome. So I wanted to start out, I yeah, actually, I want to start out with the project that you mentioned you were uh, embarking on now. Uh, so we, we spoke a little bit on how some, sometimes these models can be a little bit cognitive heavy and they can be very conceptual um, and sometimes a little bit divorced from reality. And so you, one approach that you mentioned you were taking is you were writing some sort of fable or uh, more of like a, a metaphorical, mythical kind of approach to helping people understand these stages. I would love to hear more about that. Uh, it's a bit of a secret that hasn't been widely shared yet, and it's not finished yet. So I hope we will. A young colleague of mine in Sydney, whom I've worked with both with his company and with him personally, and he's come to my courses when I was working in Australia. We're writing a book called well, we haven't a title yet, but it happens to be a book that uses animals, different animals for different stages. And mm -hmm. um, the setup is we're in Walden Pond, where I live, just five minutes south of it. And I'm the resident old owl. And he is the visiting otter, a young, traveling, curious otter. And he comes by and I'm, we're starting a conversation and I get him to settle down enough to say, look, I can show you some interesting things. You don't have to rush all over. Let's just every day that for the next week or so visit another animal, resident animal in this area. And we will talk to them and there, it turns out there are different stages in increasing levels. And so we, so we have conversations with these critters and experiences with them. And at the end, we haven't quite decided it. I hope we will have, because the beach, whoever has been to Walden Pond knows that there's a beach. We will have a beach goodbye party and a beach party where all the critters have to, perhaps, I mean, this is still in the fantasy realm, will agree write agreements of how they're going to live together peacefully. Amazing, amazing. That is fun. Yeah. I'm, also, yeah. I'm writing the, the one book that I will probably ever write, which is on ego development. And it's way more, uh, you know, an abstract academic book. Mm -hmm. Not as academic as the other papers, but still more geared towards an audience who is interested in theory more yeah, than I can't, I can't wait to read it when it comes out I was just absolutely fascinated by the the research papers that you put out on ego development theory and the increasing levels of uh, ego maturity and all of that and yeah I, I 
it feels very pressing what you just what you just described about how all the animals can live in harmony with each other because when when, when I've studied that it's kind of felt like that was almost like the the most important thing that I got from it was like these are like different stages but like it's not like one stage is any better than the other you kind of pointed this out like you mentioned like using the terminology earlier and later rather than higher and lower because and I, I, I assume you sense the same thing, like a lot of times in the developmental psychology domain, it, it comes off as like higher, lower and people, it's, it's hard to not get away from better, worse kind of. It, it is very hard because our language, our whole way of how we describe even from our bodies, you know, when we're upright, we're healthy and okay when we're this way down. Uh, lower or earlier, it, it, it is so easy to confuse the two, and yet they're not the same. It's just kinder to say earlier and later, mm -hmm. um, and less provocative in the sense of misleading you to think higher is always better and earlier is always worse. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I, and th this is one of the things I really wanted to, was fascinated about and wanted to bring up with you was kind of this sense that one of the, the biggest trap I see is this higher, lower, better, worse thing. And it, I, I notice a lot of it in kind of some of the integral communities where it's like, um, like kind of a push towards want people wanting to be like uh, seen as second tier or like uh, as like these top stages. And a lot of times it, it almost feels like there's a lack of harmony between all the stages. And I, I would love to hear kind of your perspective on like, what, how do you view this? Like, do you view like the stage development theory, like the value in a human being learning it as being like learning how to integrate every single stage within their psyche all at once and to create harmony between them? Is that kind of how you're viewing the value of learning and understanding and studying this stuff? Integration is, of course, the most important part of the whole thing, but it is also true probably that being able to integrate, you have to be at the relatively later stage or post-conventional before you simply mm. don't see that there are other stages and other ways of making sense and other perspectives. So you have to have that capacity to then not say, oh, if only everyone was just like us, mm -hmm. then the world would be fine. Then you start yeah, to realize that right. even at the early post-conventional, that's still the case when you think of what's called green in integral. All mm -hmm. the people who really, really feel if just the world was greener, green in that <laughs> psychological sense, then we would, you know, it would be a better place. It isn't necessarily. For one thing, we need all the other stages. We need people who embody and do the work that other stages also do. And even at yellow and at integral, there is this fantasy that once you get there, then you will be saved in some ways. There's yeah. a lot of, of that thinking because we live in such difficult times. We all wish, I mean, the whole ancient idea of salvation, something that will save us. And a bit of the integral fantasy is that later stages, transcendence will save us. Mm. Yeah, wow. I, I, yeah, I never really made that correlation. It's almost like I've noticed in Integral, they speak a lot about how uh, all the way up to green is kind of this approach towards like people want thinking that everyone should be at their stage is stage. And then once you get to Integral, um, I, lo I love how you kind of explain that sometimes even in Integral, there's not fully the, the embodiment of if people, if only people came to Integral, then the world would be a better place, right? So it almost it's feels still, like, yeah. yes. Still there, Still and there. integral for the is probably the first stage who has a true understanding of their own developmental stages. Mm. But doesn't mean necessarily they then can fully appreciate the energies of the other stages that come earlier in other people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That it almost feels like that's the the most essential or like the most essential thing moving to integral is really understanding the necessity of every single yes. stage. And uh, how it comes up for me is like, it almost feels like uh, the, the conventional and post-conventional stages can almost cognitively 
uh, intellectually understand the stage model, right? But it almost feels like just because you can intellectually understand it doesn't mean the integral embodiment of, of being able to interact and like not feel higher or lower has come online yet. That is so true. And so much an issue with, with any theory really, because you don't need to be post-conventional. You have to probably have formal operations if we want to talk technical mm -hmm. in order to understand. But from there, you can really absorb almost any theory and know about it, what we call aboutism. Mm -hmm. ah, yeah. And talk beautifully about it and, and can you know lecture about it and teach it, but not live it. Big difference between yeah. spouse theory, these are all technical words, versus theory in action, lift theory, embody theory. That's a whole other ball game. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, and this is one of the directions I really wanted to go and to discuss with you is what 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 does embody like this feeling of embodying the theory? And we, we were speaking a bit about on this, which is a lot of times the theory can become abstract. And a lot of times it almost feels like in my experience, when I, the more I study the theory, the more abstract it gets. And a lot of times it's really hard to take it out of that abstraction and just like to, to relate with people at different stages of ego development on a way where I truly connect with them and don't see it any higher or lower, but just like the earlier, later, um, even sometimes in my experience, I feel like the later, I put more weight on the later than the earlier stages. It almost feels like that's the same thing happening. And so you, in one of your speeches, you actually, uh, or, or in one of your, in the research paper, you wrote uh, the quote, the maps of reality we construct with words um, can never depict the undivided whole, the actual lived territory. And yet we believe that we capture reality when we concoct plausible explanations about it. Um, I, I absolutely love that. And, <laughs> and I, I just wanted to dive in. Um, I wanted to hear your thoughts on what does it look and feel like to kind of operate from that place where you understand that the map is not the territory and that the theories and all of our more and more complex ways of making meaning and maps and theories and meta theories and integral theory and this theory and that theory, right? What does it look like to actually take, like to learn from them and to study them, but then to drop them and to kind of relate with the world as it is with that knowledge kind of embodied? It's an ongoing challenge not to fall prey to the explanations that we all have for everything that happens in life. Because we're, we're as human beings, and that would probably be my main thesis, is that the ego is the storyteller, no matter what the situation, no matter who, no matter what language, uh, there's always the storytelling. Because we, we want orientation, we, 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 are, we need it, we couldn't live without it. And so to get to a point where you can at least occasionally look back and say to the ego, oh, shut up, be quiet. I know you do your thing and you do it very well, but right now we're not gonna do, we're just gonna be right now, right here in this moment. And when I'm with another person or with myself, I'm going to be real in the sense of I'm totally open and curious. What is it like to be Ethan? What is it like to see through his eyes, listen with his ears, you know, walk in his shoes, that kind of immediate uh, questioning on being with somebody else and for oneself too. What is it like to just listen to the wind? We had storms today in northeastern around here and we lost power. And so, but it was interesting to listen to the wind through the trees. Uh, that and, and just enjoying that, just being in, really enjoying whatever it is that's in the moment here. Wow, beautiful, beautiful. I, I, I totally resonate with what you said, like, 
Um, what does it feel like to be you? And then to just listen to that with no conceptual overlays. I love that so much. Um, yeah, this, this feels like a good segue into, I was fascinated by some of your, your work on the construct aware unitive stages and kind of how I, I was fascinated by the arc where you showed that you go to increasing differentiation, the more like starting from like stage one to like three or so. So you're differentiating into this separate self that feels like it's a solid ego, a solid story about who I, it is yes. and what it's doing in the world. But then I found it fascinating of like working to understand the, the um, what do you just call it? Undifferentiation or like going, going back Deconstruction, um, yes. Deconstruction, yeah. Or yeah. even just softening the boundaries because before mm -hmm. you have such clear boundaries between me and you, between mind and soul and whatever you distinguish, it's very clear. Yeah. And, and it softens, it opens. Yeah, absolutely. I, I would love to dive into that. Um, it, it almost felt like what when you just said, like, what does it feel like to be you? It almost feels like to fully be able to listen is to like kind of have a soft boundary, like ego boundary, you know? I almost have this sense of like, if you get like an expert achiever, right? To ask that question, it's a lot of times it, it's almost gonna feel like hard to, to fully understand and listen to someone, right? When you, when you ask that question versus it feels like when you start to, um, when you start to deconstruct the ego, it becomes easier and easier to just let yourself like throw yourself into the worldview of someone else and to realize that like when this, yeah, that to not have anything to protect almost. True. And I would add, you can observe some people you can talk, you know, they themselves can respond to you, not in the same way, you know, of complexity or depths that you might want to listen, mm -hmm. but you can watch them, you can watch them work. You can watch them do something simple and realize just the beauty of it. A mother swaddling her baby or changing her baby, you know, how she does that. That could be a beautiful moment. She may not be able to talk about who she is and what her dreams are, any of that, but you can still get a sense of the person through that, through watching, not just listening. Mm, wow, I love that. I love that. So I have this, I have this sense, uh, we spoke about this as our society is like facing more and more of these, like these bigger problems, you know, all of these, uh, the cry, uh, there's this word that we spoke about, like meta crisis, which is basically just like, all right, we have like the ecological crisis, but then we also have like, people are struggling to make meaning because of this more like, uh, expert achiever, like stage, like three to five is kind of like, there's like, we're moving away from religion, but then kind of sometimes this feeling of like nihilism or pluralism, unable to really find an adequate like sense of meaning arises. I would love to speak on um, how, do we, how do we respond to these crises using the ego development theory in, in your experience, how are you kind of relating to these crises that we're facing and how to kind of respond to them with uh, billions of people at different stages of development and this very complex, uh, intricate pattern of people at different stages interacting with each other. Uh, how, do you, how do you approach like being in relationship to the world in a way that, that creates harmony that potentially uh, helps us move forward in a way that we could solve some of these existential risks, uh, given that everyone's at different stages of development in this complex pattern? One thing that I, again, has a little bit to do with development is the sense of how much control we have over life and over things and over matter. I just read, yesterday read the main article, the, the entry article in the Harvard Magazine by the... Uh, see that sometimes my issue memory is no longer the strong was never totally strong but it's fading sometimes the the not the director the, of a university president and he wrote we are gonna figure out how we can control matter and i just my heart just sank <laughs> because obviously it, it in his world 
there is no sense, really sense yet, how little control we have over the universe, how little. Uh, yes, we can make good efforts. Yes, some the small way we can all save things and we can be careful with energy. But in the big picture, I'm not so sure. <laughs> <laughs> we can even change things at this point because, because things have already deteriorated so much. And it's my generation, I suppose, that feels most sorrow about that. Because what we leave behind for the, um, what I leave behind for my grandchildren, I sometimes really truly worry. How will they uh, find a way in the world we have now? Uh, I don't, don't know. I just hope that human nature and faith, faith in, in life uh, will show us when we look at nature, you see that things can go bad for a long time. I think of Chernobyl, for instance. And yet there have been animals who found ways to live there again. That kind of faint hope <laughs> that yeah. something will change. I don't think it will be by intellectual endeavors. Mm. Yeah, wow. Well. I think, I think you, you've spoken about this a bit too. It's almost like I would love to hear your thoughts on like this feeling of not knowing or of the unknown. I think you said in one of your lectures, like the more the, as you go through the developmental process, you realize the value of like not knowing and yes. like the true, the true like essence of like development is like the more you're like, oh, I don't know. And that's okay. And like, I can actually be okay with not needing to know and to grasp onto all of these yes, things. and explain everything. Yes, you said it beautifully. Yes, that is part of the coming. And there's also part of then that gives you energies you don't use up if you have to memorize things or know. That mm -hmm. already takes energy. If you don't have to know, then you can be fully open to what is. Right, in right, a way right. that you can't if you have to know and predict or think of the past and all of the things we do mm. we all do i'm not saying i, I don't <laughs> or you should <laughs> we do it it's automatic when you are a human being but it's also possible to not know and to unlearn and to even unlanguage imagine if you don't have words and you experience and you don't try to name it just be with it nameless yeah beautiful beautiful i as, as you're speaking i'm getting the sense that that like as we go through this developmental model it almost starts to merge with like a, almost like a spiritual line of development too it's it's sounding like a very almost like zen uh like way of approaching things like kind of letting letting go of all these conceptual models and seeing the world as it is without anything overlaid on it from all the different spiritual practices and schools i have experienced i would say zen is probably the closest to how i also naturally think about things, but I feel in no way necessarily enlightened, just uh, a little older, a little wiser, you know, a wise old bird like the one yeah. <laughs> in the old <laughs> forest. Absolutely, absolutely. And it, it almost feels like I, I, I had this, this sense of like, Zen is coming at it from this like very, like anyone at any stage of development can go into Zen and kind of cultivate that level of like uh, seeing the world without conceptual overlays, but it almost feels like, all right, like anyone can go in that at any stage into Zen, but also like, it almost feels like the big pinnacle of like just um, ego development is like coming back to like the Zen thing. It almost feels like once yes. you, once you develop enough, you develop, it's like, it's like a, you start out as a baby, undifferentiated, like consciousness, right? And you go through all this intellectual development and like all this stuff. And then it almost feels like you come back to that. You come back to that like concept, concept, concept less, no concept yes. way of and viewing things. You know, the, the pictures, the ox herding pictures, that's exactly that story. 
you go, you go higher and higher up the mountain. And eventually when you come back, you carry water and chop wood. There's nothing new, but you do it with a new way. The thing is, mm. the consciousness has changed the way your attitude towards what you're doing, but not the actual doing. Mm. Uh, yeah, that's, that is true. And that's why the art to me is in some ways a more or just as informative an image of development as the usual spiral, upward spiral, which also mm. softly or slightly gives the impression that higher is better because we are, you know, programmed that way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But this doesn't, this goes back from the other way to say this, from increasing complexity to the simplicity beyond. Mm. Yeah, I love, I love, I love the arc that, yeah, that you put forth where it's almost like the, the highest altitude is like the stage three, four, five of like expert achiever and all that stuff. And then you, you end up going back to kind of the undifferentiated where you started or the deconstruction where you started almost. Um, I would just not say undifferentiated. I would say um, unified, where you put it all back together, mm -hmm. because there is a big difference between an unconscious, relatively unconscious newborn and a very conscious later stage person. Right, right. But the experience may not be that different. It's just mm -hmm. a new, there's a, a subtler filter behind it. Yeah, yeah. So. And then I wonder, and that's really typically me. You may already have noticed I'm a bit of a skeptic in general. I don't have the rah, rah, rah attitude to its life. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then yeah. I start questioning myself, my own skepticism. Maybe I'm really, really on the wrong track. Maybe, maybe there is a God. Maybe there is any of those things that to me so far have not helped too much in life. Um, I don't know. And then you get back to that. I simply don't know. And I do trust in my experience in some ways. And also the experience of others that talk about their experience, but I'm not sure. Yeah, I, lo I love that approach towards things because it, it, and that's kind of what we, what we were spoke speaking about at the beginning was like people in the integral can like, oh, if everyone was just integral, if everyone just mastered ego development theory and like developed, then the world would be a better place. But it, it doesn't feel like you are holding that attitude towards it. It feels like uh, your relationship, I would, I would love to dive into like your relationship to it, right? So it, this is, I imagine this is like your baby, right? This is like your lifelong project of developing uh, ego development theory. And I would love to hear, I love how you hold it like almost lightly, like, it, I get this sense of like, if someone's going to like almost criticize it, it's almost like you're, o you're almost like open to it. I get the sense of it. Like, Oh, perhaps there are, there are holes in my theory, you know? I'm not Absolutely. I'm almost sure there are holes in <laughs> anything you assert. There is no place to assert from. So I use the ego as the storyteller. That's just an invention. It's a useful one because I don't know anybody and no culture where stories are not being told, where we come from, where who we are, where we're going, what happens after death, how we relate to the mysterious, all of that. There's stories across the world. Now, there are differences. I'm talking from a Western European perspective, what's called weird Western industrial, what is it? Western educated, industrialized, etc. Mm -hmm. W E I R D. I grew up in it. I'm totally in, embedded in it. And I have a perspective on it because it really, really is not the way all cultures see the self as a separate, so separate individualistic we are here in the US and in the West. Yeah. And across the world, and that, that now gets programmed into other people. Um, 
and that that's a real loss. Uh, I don't think it's necessary. That's why I'm talking about the party of how can we live together more peaceably? Mm. How can we share more? So it becomes a shift in my own thinking recently has been towards thinking more of values and virtues because those are not necessarily stage related. You can have very advanced stage, very cognitively clever folks who can talk beautifully about developmental theories or other theories. And, and they're actually not very nice human beings. They don't embody it very well. Mm. And you can have very simple beings who by their very, just being in their presence, you know, they are beneficial for not just themselves, but those around them. Mm. They, carry, they carry something. And these are the old ancient virtues, courage, generosity, uh, what else? The, yeah, there's a whole long list of them, but those are actually not uh, dependent on stage so much. Yeah, this feels like a very splash of fresh water in like in studying so much developmental theory i've i've been asking myself for a while like what are the values of the lower stages like what like how can i really careful i do not want to hear oh yeah earlier 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 yeah. <laughs> sorry it's a it's a habit <laughs> so yes like what what does it look like to to truly embody this understanding that earlier is not better than later or like and i think you were just pointing at that like the values and virtues thing i i hadn't heard it explained like that before but it's it's almost like um i wanted to bring up there's another developmental psychologist these days that has been in in it, talking about something very similar um his name's zach stein and he basically talks about you can have psychopathologies is what he calls them or like pathological aspects of any stage like you can have like always unitive, been true right you can have like always the, been true yeah the it's, latest stages and i wanted to say something else i didn't invent ego development theory jane lovinger did uh, and i learned from her and then very quickly in the 19, early 1980, I discovered that her theories had some shortcomings mm -hmm. uh, that I then was curious to find out whether I could make sense of things that didn't make sense to me. But it definitely on her shoulders, I would not have come up with, with the theory. And I liked it better than the other developmental theories because it, it, it focuses so much on language. And that was my unique entry to it. But really, I, I didn't invent it. Yeah, that's, thanks for pointing me out on that. I, uh... That's always true, too. The whole idea of self-made men and, and, or man uh... and all of that. It's so individualistic and Western. No person ever is self-made in that sense. We all need others to... <laughs> To, to get where we are mm -hmm. yeah it's like it's are. it's like we can't even exist without everything in existence right now it's like i'm oh. sure like you say like you didn't create it that, like jane lovinger did but like from another perspective she just connected certain dots that were already in she place did. before she, she was wrote born. beautiful books on how she got her ideas and where she drew from yes so, and that's true for all of us hmm. Yeah, I, lo I love that. I love that approach. It almost feels like it's just really beginning to embody how everything is interconnected, right? And so it's like uh, one way that I've been I've found fascinating recently has been just thinking of like different systems, like economic, political, all these things. Like I couldn't actually be sitting here right now if someone didn't like create the materials for this house to be built and then transport them here. And then oh, a, a system was built to like, I, I'm relying on every single person and every single job in the world, all functioning in the, like in a, in yes. a way that lets me sit here right now and talk to you. And to be, again, to be aware of that in the moment for just close your eyes and for a second, imagine how much and how many people have 
contributed to both of us at this moment to sit here and do what we do together for a long time and just in the moment, all the technology, all the things being built, all the things being transported in whichever way it's, it, it, it is almost a spiritual experience when you give yourself that momentary appreciation. It's truly spectacular. I just, I, I get this, I get this feeling of like, I am dependent on them almost. It's like, it's like, how could I not survive? Like I am actually, I can't just be separate in like, it's not like I am creating my own successes and I'm doing, it's like, no, I actually depend on every single person. If they weren't there, I wouldn't be here right now. And that's what we call interdependence. Interdependence. Yes, that's the move from dependence very early on to independence at the, top of the arc mm -hmm. to it's a Inter new interdependence ah, which which the distinction would then be i am dependent on them but they are also dependent on me and mean. we are also dependent on other people so we're all yeah, it's yeah. all interconnected yes yeah, yeah yeah and yeah i've been playing with this with this idea i would love to hear um your thoughts a lot of the times when I hear the word interdependence get brought up, it's a lot of times it's in this like systems theory, systems thinking kind of context where people like uh, kind of the, the go to is like, let's create maps of how everything is interconnected and let's like draw lines. And but it almost feels like uh, from what, what I'm hearing from you, it's like, let's just like live in the interdependence, like as a feeling almost or like not try to conceptualize the interdependence. Well, it's not not trying it conceptualizing as a tool we have as you as human beings. Why not use it? But not mm -hmm. only having it that way. That right. again, you could be. Uh, there is uh, sometimes when we do testing, and somebody by profession is a systems analyst. Of course, they assume they are systematic. Think they're actually systems available. Of how shall I say that? They're actually thinking they are at these later stages because they can map complex systems, but they may not be. Mm. They may just be wonderfully expert achievers in their field of systems analysis. Mm. That's fascinating. I never, I never made that connection that systems theory theorists could actually be operating from an expert achiever stage of course they can i, I mean that's the <laughs> that's the thing any theory you can in and you can even be at the forefront of a theory invent new areas of a theory and still come from that i had i i should, should i say that publicly yes okay Courage is one of the things that I feel as a virtue that only serves more as you get older and need it more. Um, so I went to Harvard and I was going with all my idealistic anticipation how how much how wonderful and mature the professors would be. Well, guess what? They were wonderful, but they weren't necessarily mature. They were experts in their field of expertise. In the, they were often at the forefront of what can be thought about in a particular field, but they were not in any way more, more mature in what I was hoping for. I didn't see them as role models, as human beings, but learned a lot. That doesn't mean they're not wonderful in, in many, many ways. Right. Yeah, that was a big disappointment initially and you know that's part of being human too to have ideals how the world should be and how other human beings ought to be ideally mm. yeah i would love mm. anyway that's the yeah sort of the rude awakening sometimes are that things are not just the way we wish they were Right, right. It, it feels like it's going back to the virtues and values thing. That's where I think I'm a bit headed in my whole, you know, interest. Uh, mm -hmm. 
um, also in the public realm where, where we're thinking more about that. How can you get back to helping people really a, initially learn to pay attention to that? How can you teach it in schools? How can you, I heard a beautiful example yesterday on a Zoom call where there were several experts in, uh, in, in values. And one guy uh, talked about having introduced it and West Point to the rec recruits. They now have every day an hour, can you imagine that, at West Point to reflect and journal after supper. Really? Brilliant. Absolutely wonderful to hear that <laughs> that's where we can start if we educate if we actually help people to learn how to reflect mm -hmm. and not just drive 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 get more money get more this get the bigger house get all of that then you're a worthwhile human being the, the english language too particularly when we say how much is somebody worth you get the dollar sign and you don't get you know that yeah yeah that's that's it's so that's wow that's it's so woven into the language it is. how much is this worth and it's like wow and you've you've spoken a lot about how kind of the the central kind of center of gravity that it feels like western culture is at right now is the vast majority of people are in this expert achiever and that's kind of what's influencing the culture that's what we still have statistically when we do you know, research with tests. That's where mm -hmm. most people are. And so it almost it almost feels like when we speak about like people trying to get other people to be integral, it almost feels like that's counterproductive. And it almost feels like what you were just speaking on. I would love to hear your thoughts on like not necess the goal the goal maybe not necessarily to get people to move through the developmental stages, but more as like, all right, we have a center of gravity that's expert achiever. How can we get, uh, like, kind of infuse the virtues into that stage and to how, get the journaling yes. and the reflection? And how we're saying is, it is how can you become fully at home in where you are? Mm -hmm. When you, you know, you grow, you start initially, you have a few parts of a next level, but how can you be at home? How can you be the most you can be in that stage? And when you have that, then energy, again, energies get freed. Mm. And then, then naturally, we do develop naturally. If we're not worried and, and trying to survive and trying to get places, then, then things happen actually on their own organically, much more likely. Uh, do, do you have the, the feeling that... One, I wanted to bring up the power of language because we've kind of been touching on this. Like if language says, how much are you worth? That's going to like kind of influence someone's way to make meaning out of the world. Because Absolutely. It's gonna, and that, so, becomes a, that becomes a value. That becomes something in order to be something. I have to have more of this and do more of that. Whatever it is that, that gives you then that sense that your worth has increased. And not intrinsic worth and dignity of being a human being. Mm, yeah. Yeah. So how would you how would you think about or relate to beginning to change this language or beginning to speak in different ways, right? Let's say you're having a conversation with someone and that's coming up. I have this sense that it's almost like when you started out with like the, the focus on language, do you feel that a lot of your work has been like becoming conscious of the language that you're using to make meaning and to kind of like be speaking in ways that use language that's not supporting like, like the what are you worth in dollar signs kind of like all these different ways of perceiving do you sense that like, in your life how your intentionality behind what language you use do you feel like that's a big part of, it's of the big. process. I would certainly think so. I have been recently also writing about how, about colonization of this weird thing about the Western mind, the whole across the world and how English is a colonizing factor. 
English has a particular sentence structure. Maybe you're not aware of it, but it's very linear. Language in Absolutely. general is linear. You can't, again, you can't get the fullness of your experience because you have to do one word after another. And the English is particularly linear. You have to have a subject and then a verb and then the other stuff follows. You can't move it around. In Swiss German and German, you can move things around because we haven't lost uh, the clensions yet. Mm. So you can have a person who receives something in the beginning of the sentence, if it, it's still understandable, not in English. There's a difference between the dog bites the man and the man bites the dog. Mm. It's just the word order is, makes a difference in English. In some languages, it doesn't. Right, right. So it's richer in that sense. Um, it, it language is reducing so much that is richer than what we have worked for. Just the, the, my homesickness is sometimes around my native tongue. I still keep vocabulary books when I remember certain wonderful words or expressions <laughs> that, that I just miss because yeah. they're not, don't exist in English. Mm. Yeah. And with everybody, you know, it's become the koine, it has become one, I think Chinese is the other, but of the world languages. Yeah, it's it's almost sad to think that the Germanic and the other the other languages that have different sentence structures and different ways are are beginning to be like almost pushed out by the English language, right? Yeah, and yeah, they are. Yeah. To some degree. And there's beautiful literature in, in from all across the world in, in English. I mean, just think of the Indian continent or just, I'm always amazed just how people can use language also in an absolutely beautiful, creative way, create whole mm. worlds that we could, that they imagine, we now can imagine too, because they created it. It's yeah. both, it's both a prison and a beautiful means to mm. be a human being and imagine. And that's something I actually think, I just read an article on can, can we decipher whale language by using I, A, A, I, A, I. Yeah, yeah. Yes. <laughs> and that is fine if we can, but the fact that human beings can imagine whole worlds through language and communicate it. That is also beautiful. Right. And that's right. unique. I think that, well, I, I, I don't know whether whales can do that, <laughs> but so far, I don't think we have the evidence that creatures can do that, other creatures can do that. Mm. Yeah, it, it brings us it it brings us to this point. And this is what you spoke about in the in one of your research papers that I found fascinating was in the construct aware unitive stages, you, you go through this deconstruction process back to like unity, back to like a feeling of unity consciousness, right? And uh, you wrote something about the, the paradox or the, the distinction of, of trying to find meaning through language or, or of, of realizing the inadequacy of language to kind of get at the world that we live in, but also the necessity of needing to use it to communicate with other egos, right? That's absolutely true. It's both. That's the thing. Both and both is a and. big additional thing that comes with the post-conventional in early starting yeah. to realize there's often both and. We can be both joyful and sad or wistful at the same moment mm. it's not this or that right right you can yeah you you spoke about the complexity of the inner world becomes so much more vivid as like post-conventional and onwards right yes. where it's like like the um i th i think what you wrote about was like in the in the pre-conventional conventional there's very kind of linear ways of like i'm sad i'm happy i'm this i'm that and then in post-conventional it's like i can have this mix of so many different things going on in my internal world at the same time and that is true and yeah. i would again say if a, 
a, a, a simpler person who is not, you know, going through the stages is sad. That sadness is, a, is part of their dignity. Mm-hmm. That is part of where you can, and that's part of what makes it late. You can have compassion for that sadness, even though you have, may have a very complex in the life with 50 words for you, different shades of sadness. The very fact that this person is sad can resonate. Wow. Yeah, yeah, wow. Thank you for pointing that out. It's almost like just because something is the sadness and the understanding of the sadness is more complex doesn't mean it's any better than a less complex sadness. You know, they're both they're both sadness it's, it's, at the core. Human being who is sad, yes. The human being that's sad, yeah. Um, yeah, and I, I get this sense in what, what I was trying to bring forth was like originally when I when I started reading about um, this the inadequacy of language and like the, the abstraction being divorced from a reality, my original like kind of originally I kind of wanted to feel like, oh, that means that like the world that is uh, trans rational beyond rationality and just sees like comes back to the more uh, Zen seeing the world as it is. I was almost holding that as better, but like the both and thing is like one language can't depict reality and yet we need to use it to communicate. And so like, it's not better to use language or to transcend language. It's like, they, it's like a, almost like a, they work hand in hand, it feels like. They do. And I mean, when we grow up, we know that, you know, wolf children, for instance, when you don't learn language at the developmentally appropriate maturationally right time, you can't actually relearn it. Mm. Your body, our human minds, our, I don't know what it is, are primed to learn language. Any language, doesn't matter. Whatever is in your environment, if you're not normal. And that's another thing to point out, which I wanted to say when I mentioned Lovinger. Ego development theory is a theory about relatively functional adults. It does not include psychopathology. And of course, psychopathology of the minor to the major ways happens all across the board. There's no, at any stage, you right, can have right. rem, you know, reminiscences or touches of it or pockets of parts of your life that you have not integrated trauma. Mm. Even if you've evolved quite well and you're quite mature in most cases, there can be pockets that are not. Uh, uh, yeah, so I, I make that distinction. It's an idealization. It's a theory about relatively functional adulthood. Yeah, I, I, that feels that point feels so central that I, I just I just want to highlight that, you know, of you can have like psychopathology at the high the latest stages of development. Oh, you can be a terrible can... narcissist. Right, right. Too. Of course you can. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that and that really that really helps I feel like um really embody this understanding that there's no better or worse there's no later is better than earlier. It's almost like you, you can be a psychopath at the latest stages and like or you can or you can be fully functioning and very high Lovely. in dignity and courage yes. all of these things at these very um, simple ways. Stages. Yeah. Yes. Yes, that that is important to to realize and not to overestimate or overvalue the later stages. And and we haven't talked about the what do you call it in ah, words it escapes me, maybe it comes back. Um, spiritual materialism, I guess Strunka called it, but I was looking for another word. The, the fact that we that so many people nowadays because it's become such a a commonplace everybody does yoga everybody that goes to spiritual schools and meditates and it can just be an escape mm. and it's a beautiful escape i mean it's better somebody sitting and meditating than going out and killing people but it's still an escape from the reality it's still an is often the life is so difficult that we tend to want to 
to get out of it in some way or another. And it's also good teaching because when we do meditate, we may actually discover some things we wouldn't otherwise. <laughs> but it's 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 a it's a fine thing to to notice in the bigger culture just how much now that has become just another fad to as far as I'm concerned. Mm. Lots of money is being made. Yeah, it, it it almost feels like the expert achiever culture has kind of co-opted yes. spirituality. And that culture will co-opt anything, anything in the world. Mm. <laughs> anything that it can, anything that it can, yes, that that it can, can get, get capital out of. It can make you feel like you're inadequate. And if you don't have that, then you're not adequate. Mm. You're missing something. I, I want to, do, do you have this sense that like this inadequacy thing or this feeling of not being enough almost can be exacerbated or made worse by this expert achiever culture? Do you, do you make like strong correlations? I would just say, yes, I wouldn't. I would say the bigger picture is the cultural press towards that level. I mean, it's not just individuals, it's the whole culture that in programs us to think that way mm. that's why moving beyond the middle to the early post conventional that's the first time you look back and you say oh my god i didn't realize how much i was programmed socialized to see the world in a particular way and that's the first time when you realize that other people see it differently and that becomes actually intriguing rather than a threat before that it's a threat it, and that that almost feels like the uh the push towards unity after d differentiation the push back towards unity almost feels like i think you described it as like you're increasingly becoming aware of every single cultural conditioning and program that you've lived with your whole life almost yes yes mm. And that then can free you, if you wish, to, to not take it as a burden that you are programmed. Because, again, it's, we wouldn't become grown-ups if we didn't get programmed in some yeah, way. Yeah. It, but you can also free yourself to some degree from that. Yeah, it feels like it relates deeply with the, the the point you made about if someone a kid doesn't learn language but by a certain developmental stage or age or something that they, it's hard for them to learn it for the rest of their lives. It's almost like you, you need the yeah. you need the programs in order to then like go beyond it. And, them. Yeah. And one thing I've never forgotten, remember the early book by Ken Wilber called Transformations of consciousness. He wrote it with Engler and Brown. And Engler said something in that book in 78, a long time ago, that struck me. I've never forgotten. He said, you have to have an ego before you can let it go. Anything you have to first have developed, you have to have it before you can let it go. And so much of what the spiritual hmm, industry, let's say, wants is to have you let go before you have had ever an ego or anything good to work with or values, strong principle values before you let go. You can't. Yeah. You have to have a habit before you can let it go. Yeah, and it, Just it, feel it in your hand. You have yeah, to have it. Yeah. Then you wow. can let go. Yeah. And it, I, I've heard this explained similarly too, where it's like, you need to, I've heard it explained as you need to have a healthy ego before you can let it go. And I sense that this is the spiritual materialism thing is, uh, or, or what you were talking about is like, sometimes the, the or the spiritual bypassing is like the word. Yes, I've heard that's the word is. I was looking for before. Yeah. Yes. It's almost yeah. like you can have un, like psychopathologies and unhealthy egos and then trying to transcend the ego from that unhealthy ego place, which doesn't doesn't feel like a good it idea really whatsoever. Can't quite work, no. It causes more suffering in all kinds of ways. Yeah. And I I, lo I love to hear your your just elaboration, or I I love hearing the the dignity and the courage and the the virtues uh, perspective on it because I've had this feeling as well. 
um, I've been traveling for a little while and I've been like spending time in some of these like uh, spiritual kind of new age hippie communities, right? And some, when, I, when I'm in these communities, a lot of the time, something just like almost feels off like a little bit. And I'm like, something doesn't feel right here. And it almost feels like uh, just the, there's not those virtues in place. And there's kind of like this uh, better, like we're going to create the, the better world and, and kind of like kind of uh, repressing or um, not integrating all of these earlier stages in a way that like doesn't have any sort of virtues and values in it and part of the virtues if you win the world now use that word for the earlier stages is think of it as energies sometimes there's happy situations in life or still are in some places where you actually need that opportunistic energy to survive or you won't mm. do you have it access to it not necessarily if you're floating up in the later mm. areas, you may actually not have that as part of, of your own resources. Right, right. It feels like this is deeply related to the interdependence idea we talked about. Like we need like we're we're interdependent in like we're dependent on the earlier stages in the same way they're or or like all the stages are dependent on each other on the right? whole, yes and then if yes. we just moved everyone to a later stage it would kind of collapse almost oh absolutely we, the, the things wouldn't run would <laughs> it? so yeah we and, and it's it's only bad if you think there are jobs that are lesser worth again the worst thing that it's better to be i don't know what than to be a sports star than to be uh post office i went to post office to buy some lovely stamps today <laughs> they had a beautiful tiger uh, and i was very happy to find them as a stamp <laughs> the, the it, it's almost like that's less worth that job than than you know all the celebrities of this that that's the other part of the, our culture that sometimes saddens me is just this overextended celebrity worship. And in German we say das Leben der anderen. Our own lives are so poor or feel so diminished that we live through others and gain some stature for ourselves by you know, supporting a team and when it wins, then we go, hooray, hooray, and we feel good. That was such a, a teaching to me here in Boston when I think it's the Red Sox. I'm not a sports <laughs> specialist. But when they win, the whole you can feel the whole town is happy. And when they lose, you can actually feel a pal over the city. Because people take that so personally. They so identify with these sports stars. It, it's uh, been a constant puzzle to me how that happens. But I think it's because their own lives are like Thoreau says. They're quietly uh, despairing. And, and so this is what lifts them up. And then there's the downfall when the... the, the Red Sox lose. <laughs> yeah. It feels very related to the expert achiever cultural kind of program of like, uh, if, if the, the achievement is like the highest, like the fame, the money is like the put on the pedestal that's because it, that's yeah. what's valued in that, in that kind of stage. And then we were um, going to put the, the wealthiest people on the biggest pedestal. Yeah. And we do. We could con constantly hear reports who has more money made, who is the most billions and, and that sort of thing. And people want it. Yeah. And it is, it's, I, I, I want to bring up this point with you. This is um, something I've been contemplating in my own life is seeing, seeing, uh, like, like that's what they want, but I almost, I'm starting to see like an innocence in every single stage, right? Because it's like, all right, if, 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 if uh, like in my life, I see at one point, I really put certain people on pedestals, you know, like, like scientists or like, or, or like there was, there was always people I was putting on pedestals, right? And now I'm like, I'm trying not to do that. But I realized that that's at, at that stage in my life, 
that's what felt right, you know, or like, or like that was the current developmental process I was going through. And it's almost like there's this innocence in every single stage I sense, you know, like if, if someone is, is, is propping up this like uh, expert achiever culture, they're not doing it on purpose, knowing that there's something else and they're still continuing to do it, even though they think it's wrong. It almost feels like, no, it's just, it's just out of innocence. It's like, oh, I'm going to prop up this culture out of innocence. Cause that's what, that's where I'm at in my developmental process. So that one can make a distinction between idolizing and putting on a pedestal and having role models. Mm. Because we all need that as well. And that's one way that growth can happen. That's one of the forms of how development, vertical development happens is we actually in the presence of people who seem to be able to make sense in a bit more complex, more loving, more whatever it is, way than that we have. And so needing role models, we do, but we don't need to put people on a pedestal. That's a whole mm. other story. Right, right. No, yeah, it, I guess I was making that distinction, yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, a, a big question that I had for you is, and this is like a really big question, so you can take it as, as you want, um, but how do you see like ego development theory fitting into like our modern world? Or how do you, how do you see like, what do you see as like maybe the most uh, salient, relevant um, applications of the model? Like, like using it as a tool to better interact with and be in the world and relationship uh, what do you see like that in today's world? Like, where do you see the value of in ego development theory? Um, like what domains of life almost, I feel like would be a way of framing it. In some instances, particularly in the Western world, when we use it, uh, it does give a fairly good map of development and what describes what different levels have that are, that are actually useful. Uh, we are not saying all the stages are the same. I wouldn't say that. I would say for certain contexts, it is useful to be at the later stage. It's just not a, a rule that it's always better. It's not always better. It's a matter of fit. It's a fit with your context, a fit with the, the tasks you have to complete, you know, the task environment, your personality makes a difference. There are whole many, many in ingredients that make it a, either a good fit or not a good fit. And when it's not a good fit, people do suffer in some ways. And so it, it, if I'm to like to pitch this back to you, it feels like uh in order to find applications and uses for this model in today's world, it's almost what I got from that response was like, first we asked the question, what context is this model useful? And when we're going through the world and we recognize that context, we're like, oh, wow, this is a context or this is a certain way in which using this model in, this, in understanding later stage development uh, is gonna be very useful in helping us solve this problem or helping us understand this. But then also it feels equally important to know which context it's not. It's almost, it could be almost harmful. Um, it can and then, be harmful, yes. And to, to, yeah. So the helping professions, it's useful. Teaching, it's useful to have some sense. I mean, obviously teachers ought to have a sense. Uh, elementary school teachers should have a sense of Piaget stages of child development. Mm -hmm. And then it's helpful in the coaching. Coaching, I'm coaching quite often. I actually have to leave because I have a, an engagement in the next hour. Um, there it is helpful because then you can, what we, the technical term is we can tailor what we do, how we approach a person, how we listen to them, what we, questions we ask, how much we support them and just celebrate with them where they are and how much we challenge. The later the stage, the more I will challenge. And really, you know, <laughs> in all kinds of ways, uh, that has to do with my understanding of the theory. Mm. So I can 
tailored, but it never changes the fact that it's a privilege to be with another person in a coaching situation, that they give you enough trust that, you know, that they are actually with you for an hour or so. That remains the center of the interaction. And sometimes it's not developmental. Sometimes somebody needs practical advice of how to talk to a superior and then we can practice in a session how that would be. I'm the superior and you tell me what you think till you feel confident enough to do it Mm -hmm. with the real boss. It's not always about development in that sense. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Mm. Well, yeah, I'm going to uh, respect your time. Oh, we, we can come to a close here. It's been almost like an hour, hour and 20 minutes. Um, I, wow, I, I really, I really appreciate it. It's an honor to get the time to speak with you today and to pick your brain on so many things. And yeah, just thank you so much. And think of that language breaking my brain. It hurts. <laughs> <laughs> <laughs>